This is the Waitrose Cookery School. Welcome to my top table. He grew up in a guest house in Skegness. He worked the beach as a donkey boy and is now in charge of a global restaurant empire. My guest is Jason Atherton. Jason, welcome. Is Thank there you. stuff of dreams, this Hollywood stuff, this story of yours, a skeggy donkey boy, all that. And now, how many projects have you got underway now? Uh, we've got 15, we're about to launch our 15th restaurant, and we grow to 25 restaurants over the next five years. 25? Yeah. Covering how many continents? Uh, we're, we'll be, by then, we'll be in every continent across the world. It's <laughs> really? pretty, pretty crazy stuff. Yeah. Did you ever imagine that would be the... The, the, the case? No, so Michael, I, ne I never dreamt in a million years. When I, when I left Skegness at 16, all I ever dreamt of being was a great cook. Uh -huh. Not even a great chef, just I just wanted to learn to cook properly yes. and, and be good at my craft. Yes. And then it just took a life of its own and it was like a roller coaster. I just hung on for dear life and, and just hope it never stops, you know? Before we trace that path of yours, um, how do you maintain control? Because with a chef with a reputation that you've got, the Michelin stars and all that, and at a distance, five to 10,000 miles where you have a restaurant. How do you ensure that your reputation is being shredded over there by somebody who is, you know, just not up to it? Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, first of all, they've all have got to have worked in close proximity to me at some point in their career. So they've had to have spent time with me on the stove. That's super crucial. And I run, rightly or wrongly, I run every restaurant with a chef patron. So every restaurant has a chef who runs it like its own business. I give him a share of the business. Uh -huh. So we invest in it as a company. It's his restaurant. Yes, it bears the company name, but I never allow it to bear my name. So each one's got its own identity, like see, yeah. Eskina in, in Singapore, or Table Number no. One in, in Shanghai, or even Pond Street Social, my flagship, still doesn't bear my name. Going back in your career, um, was there a moment when a chef said to you, I think you've got a great talent? My first ever job was at a, a really sort of mediocre hotel in Skegness called the County Hotel, and there's a general manager there called William Drummond. And I'll never forget him, a big, tall Scottish bloke, um, um, very rotund and, and, and very strict. And he set us all a task once. I was only there for like six months, and, and he set me a task and said, I want you all to create a dish. And I was only a commie chef. And I created this dish, and he said, wow, that's, that's really nice. And I was like, oh, is it? And it was the first time anybody in a workplace had ever told me I was good at something. And I sort of like, you know, it was, it was a little bit addictive and I kind of like this. And, and he said to me, "You'll one day you will be one of those great chefs in London. I just know it. And I was like, this guy's crazy. He's either been drinking or something. I don't know. You know? And i never forget, the very next day, I went out to, to the high street in Skegness. We had a W.H. Smith's there. And I bought this book called Dining in France. And I opened it up and it had all the great chefs in there, like Alain Chappelle, Marc Monod, mm. uh, Pierre Gagnon just started his career then. And I saw this beautiful food and I was like, if I'm going to do this for the next 50 years, I have to cook food like this. I didn't say I wanted to be one of those chefs, I just had to cook food like this. And then the very next day, I wrote to all the top chefs in London. Um, nobody would take me on apart from one guy called Boyd Gilmore. He had a Michelin-style restaurant in Kensington called Boyd's Glass House at the time. And he took me on. Uh, I came down. I had no experience whatsoever. I lived in a youth hostel in Earl's Court. And mum was absolutely mortified because I literally ran away from home. She was on holiday in Spain with uh, my stepfather. My sister was supposed to look after me. And I just came. And mum went mad when she came back. But she came to see me, saw I was living in a decent accommodation, and she was happy for me to crack on. And, and from then on, you... I mean, what's interesting about you is that you're kind of like a light the blue touch paper and, and stand back. Because you've never been frightened, have you, of actually gambling, in a sense, with your talent. I mean, you went to El Bulli, yeah. the most famous restaurant in the world. You turn up with a knapsack on your back, yeah. no credential, really, and said to them, I want a job in your restaurant. Yeah. Well, they never employed anybody who wasn't Spanish. So what gave you the information <laughs> that they were going to do anything with you except they go away? <laughs> well, he did try to tell me to go away quite a few times, but I, I was just... You know, if, if this guy's supposed to be the best chef in the world, yeah. the most talented, most creative, then I have to be next to him. You know, how can I get next to him? How can I just feed off this guy? I wouldn't say no for an answer. And I just say, uh, you know, I, I, I finished my, with my girlfriend at the time. I dumped my girlfriend. I, I packed my bag and off I went. And I got to Spain and I, I got on the bus, the, the 24 hour bus, what takes you to Barcelona. And then I, I got to Rosas on another bus. Couldn't get any accommodation. I slept on the beach. I then went up, up, up uh, Calamount Joy, up the, the little mountain range, and got to the restaurant door. And I said, "Look, you know, 
chef, I'll, I'll, I'll do anything. You know, I'll wash the pots, you know, I'll clean your shoes, I'll do anything. I just want to work it. And he said, look, you know, we just don't take people who don't speak Spanish because, you know, in the heat of the kitchen, it goes to Catalan, first of all. And he said, we just don't have time to, to, to wait for you to pick up Spanish. I said, look, chef, I'll promise you I'll do anything. And he said, after about half an hour, this begging, he said, OK, look, we'll let you stay for a month. If it works out, you can stay for the season. If it doesn't, then you've, you've just got to go. And, 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 and he said, OK, I said, I'll give it. I, I really appreciate it. Started work the next day. And I, you know, I'm not being egotistical, but I'm really quick in the kitchen, do you know? So it's like, you know, there they were these other Spanish guys opening scallops and they were a lot slower than me. So I was like steaming through the work and, and he was like, this guy's great. You know, he's getting all this preparation done for us and he's not costing us a single penny. <laughs> and all they've got to do is feed me twice a day. And, and it was just the best experience of my life. And you became friendly, didn't you? Yeah, 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 we're great friends this very day. Yeah. So, you know, we're going on a bit of a world tour together for his new cookbook coming out. So we're going to help him launch that and promote it. And he writes all the forwards for my cookbooks. And he's a big supporter of mine. So I'm very, uh, very honoured to be one of his disciples. And, and I mean, you worked, so you worked some very great chefs. I mean, innovative chefs, Marco Pierre White. Yep. I mean, he was an extraordinary thing back to what he created. Yeah, I still In have nightmares. In a sense, he was one of the first ones. Well, was. I still have nightmares. <laughs> he was tough, yeah, because <laughs> Cooking in, in back in sort of like the 80s and the 90s when he was at his peak in this country was un, unregulated. Do you know what I mean? It was like, it was just a bunch of British guys. You know, everybody in his kitchen was British and everyone was fighting to be the next Marco Pierre White. And it was literally like Vietnam. It was crazy. I mean, you know, we worked from six in the morning till one o'clock the next. You'd stay behind, you'd polish the stoves, polish the copper pans, anything to get ahead, you know? And it was just the best kitchen in, in the country, if not Europe at the time. Mm. It was really tough, mm. but he was such a phenomenal talent. I still say to this day, something like that, watching him cook, he was almost like a tortured genius because he, he was just so good at what he did. But I don't think he even realised how good he was. Mm. Cooking for him was just a natural ability he had, but he was just completely bonkers. <laughs> <laughs> but then you moved from one war zone to another, Gordon Ramsay. Yes, I did. Are yeah, you, I was... you're, are you rather a sick of a punisher? <laughs> <laughs> I just want to make sure I learned learn, learn, learn the, through the hard knocks, you know? So I was, he was, yeah, but Britain had never seen anybody like Gordon before, you know. Mm. Gordon, Gordon had the whole package. Not only was he a great chef and learned from some of the great French masters like Jean Robuchon and Guy Savoir, and and the Rue brothers, he was also great on TV. He was a, he was media savvy. Absolutely. He he you know he could he could charm the pants off a, a thousand ladies. In, 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 you know, and he was just like the ultimate alpha male, I suppose. Really, yeah. he, he had he walked in, you could he oozed confidence when he yeah, walked into the kitchen and the president mm -hmm. he's just yeah he's just mm -hmm. a fascinating guy then onto your own restaurant yeah that had always been the aim one assumes that was what you always wanted yeah so michael i mean i mean i do you know what i know i, I, I never had any i never sat and wrote it down and said i want to win my own michelin star or it was only ever about being a great cook that was the most important thing for me i i, I just I know some people, some people might not believe it, but I just love food. Mm -hmm. I'm in love with food, and I think I'm the luckiest man in the world. You know, I read every day about people winning the lottery and winning 100 million quid or doing this, and I don't sit there with envy at all I don't, I don't, when people win an Oscar or they do this. I just think I'm the luckiest person in the world to have my job and be in love with food. I just, I just love it. You know? well, what's, what's the significance of the Palmer Street Social? What's oh, you'll like this. This is a nod uh, to the Northern, northern uh, Roots, what we're both from. <laughs> All I remember is, even though mum and dad split up when I was like four and we moved to Skegness, um, I still, I'm still very much, you know, a, a, a North Not Nottinghamshire, South Yorkshire boy. Yes. I'm a Sheffield United supporter. I, uh, you know, go back to places like Cresswell and Works Up and where all the pit mines are. And they always had the social club. So anytime it was anybody's birthday or someone passed away or a celebration or it was always done at the social. The social, yeah. And I thought, you know, it's kind of cool that I'm, I was 38 at the time. I'm opening a three million pound restaurant in the middle of Mayfair. No one's going to expect to call it the social, right? <laughs> so I wanted to create like yeah. the social. The policy of working men's club. Yeah, basically. For, for, for people who <laughs> live and work in around Mayfair. I just thought it was kind of cute. So that's what I called it. <laughs> So, Jason, this is your version of the traditional silver sardine on toast, right? Yep. And this, there's a story behind it. There's a reason why you're doing this. What is it? So, so basically, what it, what it is, Sir Michael, is, is um, my stepfather, who was... Do you want to just peel them off for me? Give them a little sure. peel. Just, Absolutely. Just give them a little peel. My, my, my stepfather was like the worst 
cook ever. You know, so when my when mum and dad split up when I was about four, mum took us on holiday to Skegness and we never came back. And then she she married uh, remarried a, a really lovely gentleman called uh, called David, who was, wow. became my stepfather. But his only Achilles heel is he's the worst chef on the planet. His <laughs> food knowledge, he cannot even find his own underpants in the house. He's, he's rubbish about mum. So when mum used to go away once a year with my nan um, and uh, my aunties and stuff, you know, back in the 70s, they used to go to places like Termolinos yeah. and those sort of places. Yeah. And, and they'd go once a year. And then me and my sister, Vicky, we'd be left with Dave to cook. And we'd go in from school. And our choices were beans on toast or sardines on toast. And I loved beans on toast. But if I was always out playing with my friends, which I always was, and was late home from school, he'd always just make sardines on toast and have it ready for when I got, got home. And I hated them. And it was these things, you know, the ones in the tins, he'd just open it up, put the toast in the toaster, stick it on, and we'd sit there and chat and stuff. And I just, I couldn't <laughs> stand it. And they used to force me to eat it. And then as I got older and I did my first ever cookbook, uh, Maze the Cookbook, I just thought it'd be a little bit fun, poke a little bit of fun at him, and I'd make my own version of sardines on toast. I see. Uh, and I ended up actually putting it on the lunch menu, and it, it sold really well. So this dish was sort of my homage to him. It was and dedicated my, to him. Yeah. And then, a nice and story. Basically, what we're going to do now is make a little compote. Uh -huh. So we're going to use the sardines inside that with the tomato sauce. Yep. Some red onion. You can use normal onions. It's completely fine. A little bit of olive oil. And then we're just going to make it like a, what we call a compote. Or... And as we say up north, a bit of a mash. Mash, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so in goes the onions. And we're just going to lightly sweat those down. We just want to release... We don't want to brown them too much, we just want to release the flavours. Yeah. In goes the tomatoes. And we're, you can just put them in whole, you don't have to chop them up. They'll just naturally blister them and start to cook down. There you go, in. And you just mash all that together. Yeah, we're just going to mash all that up and make a compote. Really, this is like super, super simple. It doesn't really get... But I find... Everyone thinks cooking is really complicated, and I find it really like it's, it's really simple. It's just understanding sensibilities of why flavors go together. So sardines, tomatoes work really well together. Yeah. Obviously, beautiful red onions, garlic. Already, even though you know this is inspired, you know, <laughs> by a northerner, but this is like sings Mediterranean to yes. me. Yes, you know. Yeah, no, it's not. So, yeah, so, it's not. so, and serving it on toast is really like you know the Italian bruschetta. Yes. And yeah, we're yes. going to pan fry last little bit of bacon with it. And that's vinegar. Yeah, just a little bit of vinegar. We're going to add just a little sure. bit of. That looks very rich and very inviting. Just a little bit of lemon juice to it. Yep. Now I'm going to get on prepping the fish. All right. Sardines. They're, they're noble fish, those are. I love sardines. Fresh They are, sardines. you know, and when they're in season, they're so cheap. Yeah. And they're really good for you, you know? So... People normally say a food that's good for you. I have found the food I dislike. But that stuff I really like. I really do love sardines. Yeah, I'm a, big, I'm, I'm a big sardine fan. When they're in season, we put them on, on, on the menu. So I wasn't paying attention to where you fillet this thing. Is it just... Well, I find them, they're really difficult to fillet and yeah. get all the bones out. So you yeah. can take that one off pretty clean, you can see, yeah. and all the bones come off it with it. And then you're left with this bone here. So then what I tend to do is they're really soft. So in a normal round fish, you would turn it over and then go back down its back, yeah. but it doesn't work for that. So what I do is just then just gently pull it. It's so soft, the flesh, you can literally oh, I see. pull, pull it, it out. Off. All right, I, I see. see. Yeah. So all we'll do now is just crushing these down a little bit. Yeah. And that's making our compote. And then we can start slowly bringing it together. And all those flavours. It's the salt what helps to break down the tomatoes as well. So when these beautiful tomatoes are in season, it just really, really starts to break it down. Is that sufficient, so, that? Yeah, that's perfect, so Michael. Good, yeah, yeah, so, yeah. I'll give you a job. Thank you. For this need, if if you, you don't get very good at this interview and stuff, I'll give you a job. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> So, right, so that's on there. Now we're going to grill the sardines. And then we'll do the bacon last. And then we are pretty much ready to go. We're just going to lay them in straight. And with sardines, I only cook them on one side down, so I just get the skin All nice right. and crispy. I don't turn them over. So, people panic when fish sticks to a pan, right? If it sticks, like this is sticking a tiny bit, you always just wait. Wait till it, and as it comes really nice and crispy, it'll just release itself. All right. Well, I hope so. <laughs> well, I don't want to look foolish. Yeah, it will start to do. And just the one side you cook? Just the one side, because you can see already, because it's so delicate, it's already now starting to cook yeah, through already, so you don't, yeah. you don't need to cook it yeah. any, any more than that. We'll have a little taste of this, make sure we've got the seasoning right. Good. Very good. A bit more lemon juice. 
to the lifter. Right, so we'll just gently turn those over, like so. See? Beautiful, nice Yum. and silver. So, in goes the bacon. So we'll put the bread on. Nice little spoonful of the compote. Presentation, or you just want to? No, wanna... no I, I, I love presentation. That was presentable enough, that, didn't it? Yeah, yeah it does, right? It does, yeah. So then we just a little bit of, just a tiny little bit of lemon juice on there. Always in the restaurants, always put lemon juice on the fish because it just heightens the flavour, you know? And then we start to stack. Our sardines on top. Just gonna trim it up a little bit. So, take those two pieces. And we're just gonna lay that. And we've got, and now it's starting to look a little bit more like a, a Michelin star dish. It certainly does. And that's my homage to my stepfather, my sardines on toast with crispy bacon and beautiful sardine. And, tomato and what's compact. his name? David Keeley. Yes, the David. You <laughs> see? Well, they've got a dish named after you. That doesn't happen to many people. Here we go. Is it Michael? Mm-hmm. It could ruin my career, mouth like this. <laughs> <laughs> Is that good? Mm, beautiful. A multiplicity of tastes. <laughs> <laughs> 